Hi class and welcome to another lecture from Dr. Red on narrative poetry writing. Uh, this is meant to uh, supplement a major assignment in my creative writing courses or if you're just viewing this on YouTube uh, and you're interested in writing poetry then it should give you some guidelines for writing a successful narrative poem. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, this uh, video is going to contain some guidelines uh, for the first draft of a narrative poem, uh, as well as uh, <clears throat> some lectures that are focused on writing successful narrative poems. In particular, I'm going to be relying a lot upon the textbook uh, written by Steve Kowit called In the Palm of Your Hand, The Poet's Portable Workshop. Uh, if you don't have this book, you can purchase it very cheaply off of Amazon. Uh, the last time I saw it was selling for as cheap as $5. You could purchase either uh, edition one or two. They're both the same, essentially. They have the same page numbers and everything. And I think this is a really good, cheap uh, textbook to help you to write a successful narrative poem. I'll also be posting some links uh, to the poems that I can that I think that are good poems uh, that might uh, or and there's also some bad poems uh, that will show you the do's and don'ts and good examples of narrative poems and bad examples of narrative poems as we go along. So these are the narrative poem guidelines that I have for my creative writing classes at the university. Uh, you could also use this on your own to develop a successful narrative poem. Uh, <clears throat> and these guidelines are meant to help you to write a particular type of narrative poem, in particular a uh, literary uh, narrative poem. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> in my creative writing classes, I've been teaching students to write uh, successful short stories, things such as that. Uh, and I really emphasize in my, the next step is to write a narrative poem or a poem that tells a story. And so these two crafts of writing, writing a short story and writing a poem, share so many things in common. And this is one of the ways in which I teach people to write a successful narrative poem, especially if they've never written a poem before or if they feel uh, if they hate poetry or if uh, they feel as if they're intimidated by poems, or if they've only written poems in a certain style, this is meant to uh, challenge them and also to help them get past, on the other cases, any preconceptions that they have about poetry. The idea that I work with is that successful poems and successful stories share many of the same things and so you can build off of things that you might have been successful with in writing a short story and uh, write a successful poem as well. <clears throat> uh, so th these guidelines uh, <clears throat> I've also for my creative writing classes shared a supplemental video and I've talked about these guidelines so you can skip past them uh, if you've already reviewed uh, the other video that I have. Uh, you can skip past this or you can watch over it again. So the instructions, after reviewing our readings from In the Palm of Your Hand, that's the Quit book, and handouts on poetic elements, which I'll be sharing in a separate uh, lecture, recall an instance from your childhood, the childhood of a friend, a family member, or from your not so distant past. You can also feel free to invent a realistic character or speaker too. Ideally, the poem will develop from your journaling expenses, experiences. You may use prompts uh, on in the palm of your hand if you get stuck, or I'm going to be sharing prompts in this video to help you if you get stuck. Use specific detail, showing instead of telling in all five scene elements, which I'll talk about later. Uh, that's the key to writing a good, successful narrative poem, and pretty much any piece of writing is the usage of specific showing detail, uh, concrete imagery, as opposed to abstract language. That's the key to writing a good poem. Also show a consideration of line structure and some sound and rhythm for success, but the key element, the first thing I want to emphasize, because it's one of the main pitfalls that students have when writing a poem for the first time, is that I really want you to focus on 
showing details, specific details. If you can get that down, then we can work on the other poetic stuff later. If you can just get a basic story, the raw materials for a story on the page, then you've taken the biggest essential step uh, to uh, getting a good poem. So some things I want you to include in your poem. I want you to include at least one scene, and I don't mean setting by that. I mean one continuous event that unfolds almost as if we're watching it on film in front of our eyes that involves a person, a place, or a thing. Uh, you can use more than one scene if you want to, uh, but you need to have at least one scene, and that's the primary content of the poem is that scene, the description of that scene. Your poem should be grounded in a place. So it does need to also have a setting, not just the speaker's head. We need to be able to visualize this place. The poem, just like a good story, and that's what I'm emphasizing here, a good story is going to have scenes, going to have setting. It's also going to have conflict. So your poem needs to have conflict from the first moment right there, and that conflict needs to develop over the course of the poem. Your good poem is going to need to have characterization, at least of the speaker of the poem. That term is used interchangeably with a narrator of a story and one other person. So you need to have at least two characters in the poem. Sometimes you might have three. Concrete sensory detail appealing to the five senses by incorporating the strategy of showing versus telling. This is the key pitfall I see in students moving from writing a story and moving from a narrative poem is that they write really good stories with lots of descriptive detail and lots of scenes, but then they move to narrative poetry and it goes all abstract. Uh, so I, I want you to focus on not forgetting the things that you've learned from telling a good story, which include specific detail as you're writing this poem. And that's going to be the key challenge. Other details about this assignment, I want you to include a consistent point of view, just like in a good story, a good poem, narrative poem is going to have a consistent point of view, and that means perspective for those of you who are not familiar, like, for instance, the speaker of the poem is going to be a first person point of view, stick with that first person point of view from throughout the poem. A clear structure, the logical use of lines and stances, now this is the additional element on top of what you know from writing a good story. A good poem is going to use logical use of lines and stanzas. And again, I want to emphasize that the content, the story of it, is what's going to get you up to a B. Uh, but then this logical use of lines and stanzas is what's going to push you to an A poem in that case right there. Uh, <clears throat> the poem and rhythm and sound as well. The poem should avoid the pitfalls of poems in chapter 5, and I'll talk about that uh, later on in this uh, lecture right here in the section on awful poems. It will demonstrate an understanding and incorporation of techniques learned from our readings, these videos, and class discussion. Distinguished poems will effectively use other poetic elements. That means the poem that goes from a B to an A. To get a B, you're going to have to do those basic story elements, but then to get an A, you're going to have to add those other elements right there, such as sound, voice, and figurative language. However, I do add one caveat on this assignment in order to challenge both people who have written poems before and people who have never written poems before. Perfect end rhyme is not allowed on this assignment. That's not to say that rhyme is not allowed on this assignment. We're going to talk about the different types of rhyme and stuff like that in other videos, uh, or I invite you to Google it. Perfect end rhyme means that the ending words of every line perfectly rhyme, uh, and then it's end stopped as well. Uh, I'm going to challenge you to use other types of attention to sound instead of perfect end rhyme in order to challenge you. So you can use internal rhyme or slant rhyme, or you can use enjambment to make the, the end rhyme not uh, directly emphasized. Uh, so these are all different. You can use assonance and consonants, which are types of rhyme as well, in order to emphasize sound. So we're going to talk about those different elements in other lectures. But the, that's one of the key challenges of this poem is to avoid a perfect end rhyme. Although the poem is a first draft, it should still show evidence of revision for content, clarity, precision, detail, structure, and be free of grammatical errors. Uh, 
Although the poem may be about a personal experience, it should be written in order to connect with broader human experience. Great poems are sometimes brief, but for this assignment, I want a poem of at least 200 words. Remember that you can revise that, cut it down, and stuff like that in a finalized draft of 20 to 35 lines. If you need to write more, good. That's fine. Uh, <clears throat> I would rather you write more rather than less. Get the complete story on the page. Uh, and uh, I'm going to post a sample submitted poem in the comments on this YouTube video and also on Canvas for my students at the university. All right, so let's take a look at this idea of show, don't tell. Now, uh, for my students at the university, I have emphasized this already in story writing, but I'm going to re-emphasize this in the case of writing a poem because it's, again, the most common pitfall I see in beginning students trying to write poetry is that they go all abstract or they tell instead of show. So that's the first obstacle I usually have to overcome in teaching people to write good poetry is the usage of concrete sensory detail in order to show by examples instead of telling or summary. So if you have the Kuwit book, you can check out Memory from Childhood. If you don't, then check out this poem, this song by Carrie Underwood, which many of you are probably already familiar with, Before He Cheats. Uh, <clears throat> I really hate this song as a musical artist, but I think it's a good example of a, a song that uses uh, lyrics uh, uh, that show instead of tell. And let me show you. Uh, these poems or songs successfully use concrete sensory detail or showing instead of abstract summary. So Carrie Underwood is very specific about what her ex-lover is doing in this first stanza of the song, which demonstrates his character without abstractly telling. Uh, so here's the lyrics. Right now, he's probably slow dancing with a bleach blonde tramp, and she's probably getting frisky. Right now, he's probably buying her some fruity little drink because she can't shoot whiskey. So <clears throat> specifically, she is showing uh, <clears throat> what that guy is doing. He is flirting with other women of ill repute. Uh, she could say uh, he's probably flirting with other girls. But instead of that, she gives specific details. A bleached blonde tramp. So very, that's descriptive right there. And what is he doing? He's slow dancing. Uh, and what is he doing for her? He's buying shots. He said uh, he's flirting with her, which is just summarizing. That's telling. But instead, she shows what he's doing. And that showing through that example, uh, which is a narrative example, uh, <clears throat> she is showing his character and implying the character through what he's doing. And she's also very specific in showing what she did to him to demonstrate her desire for vengeance and getting back at him. She could have just said, uh, and I ripped up his car, but which is summary or telling. But instead, she gives specific details about how she ripped up his car and the specific ways in which she gained vengeance upon this person. I dug my key into the side of his pretty little souped up four wheel drive, carved my name into his leather seats. I took a Louisville slugger to both headlights. I slashed a hole in all four tires. Maybe next time he'll think before he cheats. So the only line that summarizes what she did is that last line right there. She could have just said, I ripped up his car and then maybe next time he'll think before he cheats. But she used specific images. And what are images? They're pictures that allow us or screenshots or little tiny videos, if you want to think of it in that way, that allow us to visualize what she did in scene. She digs her key into the side of his pretty little souped up four wheel drive. She carved her name into his leather seats. So all specific details, not just a bat, a Louisville slugger. Uh, <clears throat> see, she slashed a hole in all four tires. So this is how she ripped up his car. Instead of just saying I ripped up his car, she showed us specifically the depth of her vengeance. And that's what I want you to do in a good poem.
So show don't tell continued. On the other hand, a bad or unsuccessful poem uses abstract telling details like the following. You fill me with love. You fill me with your love. You fill me with your caring. You fill me with your thoughts. You fill me with your sharing. Uh, so there you can see the source of this poem right there. So I get no sense of what that person's love is like or what that person's caring is like or what that person's thoughts are like or what that person's sharing is like. All of these are abstract telling details. Instead, I want you to fill your poem with examples of what that person's love is like through specific moments that have been shared with that person. I want to see specific examples of what that person's caring is like by giving me specific examples or moments of when that person cared for you. I want specific examples of thoughts that you have shared with that person before and specific examples of when that person has shared with you before and fill it full with moments that you have or the speaker of the poem has shared with the auditor or the person to which that person is speaking. Uh, <clears throat> and that way we can see that person's love. It may be a cliche in itself, but this is an so many times you might have heard a lover say, I don't want you to tell me you love me. I want you to show me you love me. That's really uh, proof that you love me. And it's the same way here or with any poem. We need proof uh, to see what that person's like as opposed to just telling someone uh, that we feel love for them. Looking on a little further. So here are some elements of story writing that are also in narrative poetry. And this is the basis of writing a successful poem. If you could do all of this stuff, you can make the other stuff work. Uh, <clears throat> this is really what you need in order to get the raw materials of a successful poem. We need scenes, characters, the five scene elements, conflict and setting. If you can get those things, start with that and then you can work on lines and stanzas and rhythm and sound. Just like you would in a story, you need to allow us to see the moment unfold. The challenge to poetry, though, is condensing that moment to a few brief pictures, short videos, or images, as you don't have as much space as you would in a story. So in a story, you got eight to 12 pages. In a poem, you might have 200 words uh, or less. So the challenge is moving those scenes from long descriptive scenes to a short space. Get me that scene in just a few images. Uh, or short videos, if that's how you want to think about it. And the poem Power and Quit on page nine of Quit is an excellent poem that if you wrote this poem, then you could get an A on your poetry assignment right here if you wrote a poem like this. Uh, <clears throat> so if you don't have your textbook, then see that link right there and it'll take you to the poem. In this poem, there is why is it successful? Why does it meet the guidelines? Because it has one scene or continuous moment uh, of action allowed to unfold before our eyes. And I invite you to pull up this poem in a separate window uh, and walk through my lecture with you. There's only one scene. It's a continuous moment of these two boys who stop a train by putting up a scarecrow or a stuffed person uh, that forces the conductor to stop. Uh, it's a practical joke. And the man, uh, the boys watch the scene unfold and they're changed by this moment. <clears throat> so other reasons why it meets the assignment requirements. In this case here, we have three characters. You, you need to have two or three characters. Uh, and they're characterized through their actions, not just by telling summary. So what the boys do and how the conductor responds to the boys' practical jokes show their character instead of just summarizing their character. We also have a consistent point of view. It's a first-person perspective. 
uh, from a young boy who has grown up and is looking back on a moment that was significant to his childhood. And that's the same thing I ask you to do in your journal at the end of this uh, lecture here. We have conflict in the poem. So the first line is, no one we knew had ever stopped a train. Hardly daring to breathe, I waited belly down with my brother in a dry ditch. <clears throat> so we know from the first few lines, the first stanza, exactly the basic situation that these characters face, who is there and what they're trying to do. And we see the conflict. They are trying to stop a train through this practical joke. So in a good narrative poem, we need to know the basic situation. We need to know the basic conflict and the characters involved from the first stanza or so. And that conflict moves forward and develops to a climax, just like in a good story. That same thing happens until the engineer stops the train, starts cursing and breaks down and cries. That's the climax of the story right there. So we need to also have that in your narrative poem. The poem uses imageries, images throughout using concrete sensory detail to apply uh, to the five senses. So we need specific images that appeal to sight, sound, touch, auditory, olfactory. Uh, so for instance, in that first stanza right there, they're watching through the green thickness of grass and willows, stuffed with crumpled newspapers. The shirt and pants look real enough, stretched out across the rails. That's all visual imagery that allow us to see through description, what's happening right there. I felt my heart beating against the cool ground. Right there, we get a sense of touch with the cool ground and also with the heart beating and the terrible long screech of the trains breaking, which is hearing. So we get all, each of these are different images appealing to different senses and every line has an image. So try to have an image in every line of your poem. All right, so the other things that happen are all five scene elements in this poem, narration, description, thoughts, dialogue, exposition. I wanna see all of those things in your poem as well. So I already talked about the description. There's also narration where they are watching through the grass. Uh, <clears throat> then it was in front of us in the next stanza right there. Uh, that is narration as well. We also have uh, thoughts, we had done it. That line right there is direct thoughts of the narrator or speaker. I wanna see that as well in your poem. And then we also have a dialogue. He's screaming that he would kill us, whoever we were, the conductor is, about, four, about the fourth stanza right there. Uh, so <clears throat> all of those scene elements are there. Uh, and if you don't know what exposition is, that's base, That's the basic telling uh, of a story. Sometimes you do need a little bit of telling to establish some basic details, like this dude is my brother or we had known each other for 15 years. Sometimes you need a little bit of exposition to establish some basic elements. You got to balance it with showing. Okay, now consider other poetic elements, such as good combination of figurative and literal description. So you need those elements as well in a good poem. So the poem has lots of literal description. Uh, <clears throat> there's the long, terrible screech of the trains breaking. Uh, <clears throat> and there's the train in the third stanza, a hundred iron wheels tearing like time into red flannel and denim. So that line right there has tearing like time that's figurative elements and then into red flannel and denim uh, that is literal elements so you need a good combination of both of these you also need to use lines and stanzas and i'll talk about that further on another uh, <clears throat> slide in this lecture presentation as well as usage of sound and rhythm which i'll talk about in another presentation. But again, the basic elements of a good poem is getting that story on the paper. If you want to check out another good narrative poem, The Tooth Fairy by Dorian Lowe on page 13. It uses several scenes instead of just one like power, you, or you can check it out at that link that I posted right there below.
All right, my friends, now that we've talked about what makes a successful poem, let's talk about some awful poems. Now, chapter five of Kawit has a chapter called Awful Poems, and you'll see a lot of potential pitfalls to poetry writing. Some of the things that are talked about in that section is uh, the use of appropriate language. Of course, what I've already emphasized, language that shows instead of tells. But also, you should avoid, avoid dull, commonplace language or cliché. Uh, clichés, uh, slow poetry writing down, uh, and, and so you should really try to avoid those. These are commonplace ways of describing things, like having a cold heart, for instance. Uh, we've heard that uh, metaphor many times. Can you find another way of describing it that's fresh? Uh, <clears throat> another figurative way to describe someone's cold heart. Avoid awful attempts at poetic language. So this is where someone tries to be too highbrow. Let's try having a speaker who has a natural voice. Uh, this, the preachers that I've heard in my life are have an excellent voice uh, that is often poetic. Uh, <clears> that they have a natural style a lot of times that has been uh, developed for poetry and they may not realize it. <clears throat> and I've heard <clears throat> uh, a, a lot of people, when they talk, they have a naturally poetic voice and they might not realize it. Just a conversational style oftentimes is more poetic than some of these archaic attempts at poetry. Uh, try writing a poem as if you're talking to a friend in the modern day, not an erudite professor who specializes in Alexander Pope. And if you do that, if you write in your natural voice with attitude especially, uh, then that's going to naturally be poetic <clears throat> more so than trying to uh, <clears throat> Too often, a common pitfall is just trying to impress people with your control of the English language. Oftentimes, that falls back and, and has a bad effect instead of a good effect. Uh, avoiding sentimentality or emotional slither and instead focusing on honesty. We want an honest speaker in a poem who's prone to making mistakes and is speaking to an auditor who is also flawed. As I emphasize, in, in, in the section on short story writing, a good character in a, in a good work of fiction has flaws. Uh, so try not to make the auditor to be perfect like an angel in the same way. Try not to make the speaker to be uh, <clears throat> imperfect like a, a sinner. Uh, find a good balance of a sinner and a saint. No villains or uh, <clears throat> heroes somewhere in between. Realistic characters. The less you talk about emotions in general terms, the better. The more you describe events that convey emotions, the more effective your writing will be. That again emphasizes um, showing versus telling, and that's a quote from Kawit. Try to avoid using too many adjectives. Adjectives are telling language. So if you say, uh, that somebody is a pretty girl that's telling or summarizing what she looks like. Instead, show us how beautiful she is by describing what she looks like or by using a figurative element like a metaphor to let us visualize what she looks like. Whenever you say pretty, I have a very different idea of what pretty is than somebody else might. So you need to give me the very specific showing of what that person looks like. So adjectives, if you can, avoid them and show instead. Choose the right images for your poem and use images like I talked about in power. Uh, sometimes people misuse old illusions and mythological uh, elements. Uh, <clears throat> like in the poem Attic Revelation from our awful poems where the guy at the bottom of this uh, PowerPoint slide, you'll see uh, the person uses lines like Minerva, anguished goddess of tormented years. The problem with that is that nobody, most people that'll go over their heads or they, they won't understand what you're talking about. 
or even if they understand what you're talking about, it would hit home better if you used a contemporary illusion. If you reference Childish Gambino or Beyonce or President Trump, something like that, somebody who they have a better idea of and can relate to now instead of Minerva, who is so distant from uh, what we're used to now. Use illusions that your contemporary audience can relate to. Focus on clarity, simplicity, and directness. One of the common pitfalls of a poem is that it somebody tries to write it in such a way that they're trying to be obscure, and that confuses us, and we just can't understand what's going on. So you need to really make sure that you establish the basic details of what's happening, just like you do in a short story in the first few lines. Allow us to visualize the scene. That don't try to be so vague or coy uh, that you confuse your reader rather than show how good of a writer you are because it'll have the opposite effect that you're wanting. So focusing on clarity and simplicity and directness is the first step in writing a good poem in addition to uh, using specific details. <clears throat> All right, so check out that awful poem in Kawit chapter 5 called Attic Revelation and see the lines. Uh, <clears throat> Minerva, anguished goddess of tormented years. Who talks like that? Talk like a normal human being. And if you do that, then you're going to be writing more poetic language right there. And it will it'll sound false otherwise. Before the darkened altar of my soul's quiescent solitude. Uh, so, I mean, again, using $10 words and stuff like that, it's better to use a natural word that most people would use uh, instead of writing toward, again, a professor who's used to reading only Alexander Pope's poetry. Um, Pope was great, uh, but we're writing to a modern audience. Check out how that poem moves step by step from that awful poem to a little better poem, and he explains why it's better, to the published and great poem by Stanley Kunitz's portrait. Check out the good poem there, and I'm sorry that I can't uh, share online uh, the, the bad poems, but check them out in your book if you have the textbook. Now, uh, <clears throat> Kawit talks about in chapter three, how to break down the barriers of writing poetry by trying a hand at a prose poem. And then you might be able to tinker that prose poem into a poem that kind of fits the assignment where we're writing, where I want you to use lines and stanzas. Uh, <clears throat> Although your first draft of the narrative poem should be written in lines and stanzas, give a try at writing the story in prose first, especially if you've never written a poem before and are struggling writing. Uh, or if you have written poems before and you find that you're not showing versus telling and stuff like that, then eliminate the barrier of stanzas and lines and just write it as if you're writing a prose paragraph. And then you can go back after you've gotten the raw material for your story down and experiment and tinker uh, in a new in a word document with cutting uh, the uh, paragraph in the lines and stanzas. Just try cutting here. Oh, what happens if I cut after this fifth word? What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it look like on the page? What effect does that have? Uh, <clears throat> if you do that, chop it apart in a word processing software. I've done that many times with poems and come upon some really interesting line breaks and stuff like that by doing that. Uh, check out the prose poem, The Gift I Never Got in Your Quit Book, or here. That's a good prose poem right there. It has all of the successful elements that I'm looking for in a narrative poem, except it doesn't use lines and stanzas. But you could easily experiment with chopping it into lines and stanzas in a word processor if you wanted to. So here is some brief advice on lines and stanzas. I'll talk about this further in another video lecture. Uh, poems, most poems besides prose poems, are organized into lines and stanzas. Think about each of these as organizational units. 
For now, I want you to begin thinking about stanzas. This is the most accessible way I can describe them, as if they're paragraphs. Uh, so each stanza, if one way to think about it is that it's a type of paragraph. Uh, and what does a paragraph do? It organizes the major ideas, or in this case, it might organize major images or moments. Uh, the poem Tooth Fairy, for instance, organizes stanzas by different scenes. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> the, the poem Power organizes the stanzas by different moments in the narrative right there. Uh, or your poem might organize the, the stanzas based on major ideas. Lines are smaller units of organization. They organize smaller moments, smaller images, or smaller ideas. So different ways you can experiment with lines, and I'll talk about this in other videos, but you can try using enjambment uh, and end stopping. What does that mean? Enjambment is where you run the line over without punctuation, and end stopping, that's where you stop the line with punctuation. A good poem is going to vary the usage of enjambment and end stopping. That's a common thing I see in first drafts is some students won't use any punctuation at all. Uh, and other students will uh, uh, only use end stopping. I want you to get a variety of enjambment and end stopping. And that's the first way I want you to try to experiment breaking your line. Try to experiment with using different syntactical and grammatical arrangements. So you might have a dependent clause in one sentence and then an independent clause in the next line. Uh, if you do that right there, you might break after a verb. That's an excellent way to end a line because it drives the line forward to the next line right there. Try ending a line with a verb. Uh, and try ending the next line with the with a noun, for instance. <clears throat> uh, you might uh, break a line for dramatic effect. If there's something that leaves us hanging, like actually the word hanging, uh, then that would be a great way to end that line and start a new line because it carries us over. We want to know what happens in the next line. So it, breaking a line for dramatic effect is a good idea or sound effects, stuff like that is good too. A good poet considers every choice that she or he makes, including each line break and stanza break. So as you're making each of these decisions in your poem, think about those things. So chapter 11, Equit talks about family secrets. The poem is a photograph, and this is a way to write a narrative poem. Uh, one way to write a good potential narrative poem is to explore old photographs of your family on social media or in scrapbooks, or to ask a relative to tell you about some things that happened to them in their life or your family's past or maybe things you can't remember that or that you remember that they remember in another way. Digging into an old memory can get your mind running about potential ideas for a narrative poem. Some good other poems from this chapter that you can check out. One of them online right there is The Hat in the Sky. You can check that one out online or also The Ladies on the Beach is in your quit book. So here's a pre-writing exercise in journaling. For my, for my students in my creative writing classes, I'm asking them to post a journal on a discussion board uh, and then reply to each other's posts on that discussion board uh, <clears throat> and this is uh, in summary what that assignment is about. Our first journaling assignment is to try to recover memories of stories from your past in order to begin developing a potential narrative poem. So how do you do this? First, brainstorm or free write for 15 minutes about events from your past that have shaped you or those you know in some way. Or you can use pages 16 through 17 in the quit book to help guide you through this process step by step. Then try turning that into a narrative poem using the guidelines for the narrative poem above. I want you to write at least 200 words of poetry narration. If lines and stanzas are cramping your style, try writing it as a prose poem first and then experiment uh, with chopping that into lines and stanzas. 
This is a journal, so you can use this as a drafting and liberating place. You might experiment with cutting the prose poem into lines and stanzas after you get the words on the page. But the main thing is getting the raw materials of the story on the page by using showing versus telling and all the elements of scene. More specifically, you can use the prompts on pages 17 through 19 or 19 through 20 to get you going. Uh, the main thing is to write at least 200 words of poetry narration. You can shape this raw material into something more polished for a first draft later. All right, my friends, so this is to wrap up our uh, lecture on poetry. Other things we're going to talk about in other videos uh, <clears throat> include more about lines and stanzas and more about sound and rhythm in order to write good poems and we'll talk about more successful poems in other videos but until then as always i wish you peace love and understanding and happy writing my friends